Boys and girls, welcome to another exciting episode of the Lions Leadership Den, where myself, Alex Ochenenko, and my co-host, Steve Rosenberg, um, deconstruct some of the top entrepreneurs in the property management space and beyond, and we deconstruct their journeys, and we learn ourselves and help you, our dear audience, to get better, um, uh, have more knowledge, as well as um, reassurance that perseverance is important, but also um, not being afraid. Not being afraid is key. And our guests today, um, I would say, are fearless. Um, but here's a quick backstory. Um, both Todd Breen and Dave Holt are very well-known and respected people in the property management space today, but a lot of you don't know the Sure Vester story. Now, these guys had quite an interesting um, journey to start up the company, spin it up, and go live with the product. I'd say it was bumpy and complicated, but it's also, it was also excited for me. I was excited to watch them struggle and persevere through it. It was just one of the, I think, one of the Cinderella stories, if I may compare to that. Um, you went through partnership formations and exit. You went uh, through a, a, a business building process while each founder had at least one other business on the side or main business that they run. None of you had any knowledge of insurance industry. <laughs> um, you had massive insurance underwriting issues that you had to solve, take trips, talk to some of the top insurance underwriters in the world. Um, you had marketing and branding challenges by bringing a brand new product into the market space and educating people that A, they need it, and B, you're the right solution. And then once you got that done, you had launch delays and you had upset customers. You had to deal with all of that. And yet you're here. Impressive, gentlemen. <laughs> it's been fun. Yeah, to say the least. <laughs> well, let's start unpacking some of this stuff, right? Let's, let's get into this. And look, take us through your journey. Um, anyone, as I said, considers themselves a true entrepreneur, has a lot to learn from your story. The competence and the persistence in the face of diversity, I think that's what sort of is the name of the game for your journey. Um, why don't we start with the why? I want to just see the big picture here. Todd, maybe you can take us through why SureVestor? What is it? Why? I mean, you have other successful businesses. What, what are you doing, brother? Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. You, you, you mentioned I have other successful businesses. You know, I've been uh, local property management in Palm Beach, Florida for 38 years. Uh, and, and about 10 years ago, I got started in outsourcing to the Philippines, which is an ancillary business to my primary business. So, you know, I'm real keen on that, uh, you know, some people get tired of what they're doing and they say, oh, I want to do something new. And hopping in industry is not always that easy to do and starting in a new vertical. So, you know, for me, I just took what I was doing at my management company, which was outsourcing, and I grew it into the Philippines and then started offering that to other property management companies. And now we've got like close to 500 customers around the world that are uh, other businesses B2B. So the B2B journey was a lot more interesting for me than the B2C journey in my local market. And so in that process, I was doing a lot of speaking in Australia. And the Australia property management uh, market and industry, Steve, you've been there, and, and Dave, you've been there, right? You guys have both spoken there, right? Yep. Um, and, and by the way, that's a key thing. If you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to grow, my mentor taught me something. He said, you will always learn more from being a teacher than you will ever learn from being a student. And I spoke Todd in my industry before, but I said, okay, and he asked me to do that. And the next thing you know, I'm speaking around the world. And so um, uh, that opened this door, because I'm in Australia and I'm, I'm explaining how to use video to Australian property managers to get out of the sticky part of telling an owner that the house is in bad shape and you need five grand, right? And, and the tenant made some damages and they didn't pay rent. And, and they're all looking at me and they're kind of scratching their head and they said, well, why wouldn't you just place a claim on their insurance for them? And I said, well, because their homeowner's policy wouldn't cover that, you know? And they said, no, no, not their homeowner's policy, their landlord protection policy. And I said, they're, they're what? 
And, and they said, yeah, we would all just make a claim. And I said, who in the class would make a claim? And everybody put up their hand because that's how much landlord protection insurance has penetrated uh, the, the Australian market. And so that began the journey. I said, we need that in the USA because these guys aren't even troubled with one of the major gut-wrenching parts of property management, which is telling an owner that the money's not coming in and they need to send us some money. Nobody likes doing that. It's, it's, an, it's an admission that we didn't have success as a asset manager. Notice I didn't say we failed, but we didn't have the success we wanted, right? And so I said, man, we got to bring this over here. And I asked uh, um, uh, for an introduction to the pioneer in uh, landlord protection. Uh, and that's, her name is Terry Shear. She actually started this. And I had a, uh, flew back to Australia and had a meeting with her. And, uh, and she said, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll bring the product to the USA. Um, uh, but I want to meet your partners. And now I'm going to kick it over to Handsome Dave and tell you what happened from there. Well, it was interesting. I mean, Terry and I met in, in Miami, and she was semi-retired, traveling around the world with her husband. And um, over the course of the next uh, several several months, we um, uh, convinced her to uh, to join forces with us because it was a product. When you think about Australia, it's uh, one fifteenth the size of the United States, and this is a product that started over in Australia back in the early '90s and became very successful. And the interesting thing over there, it wasn't the consumer, it wasn't the landlord that was looking for the product. It was actually the property manager, the property management industry that wanted to find a way to reduce the risk and the financial pain for their landlord clients. And we said, well, we're, we're looking to be doing the same thing. And we're 15 times the size of the, the uh, Australia. And you know, would you help us bring it here? And um, Long story short, she agreed to partner with us to bring the product here. And Alex, as you mentioned, I mean, we went through a lot of pains of trying to create a product and an awareness of a product over here in the U.S. that had no no uh, basis. I mean, there was, it wasn't around, and so we were trying to figure out a way um, to to not only just bring this here and educate the market, but to figure out, okay, who are, who's going to be our underwriters? And so we went through great lengths of interviewing underwriters um, here uh, locally in the United States, but also nationally. And one of the things that happened over in Australia in, in a way where it, it really grew an appreciation for the value of professional property managers and landlords and gained respect for the industry over there is that the product was only available for landlords that were professionally managed. And so when we brought that same concept to the underwriters, they said, you know, this is a way for them to reduce their risk for a product. And it helped us gain the largest and most well-respected underwriters, which is Lloyd's of London, uh, to joint venture with us in this product and bring it here. And so that was kind of the, uh, the process that happened over the, the last three, uh, two and a half years before we started um, working on the software, but that's, that's where it started. So, hey guys, I got, I got a question. Um, when you guys are bringing, this is a whole new concept, right? It's like you guys are creating the word taxi, right? That never existed prior. Yeah. And so you guys are in an industry saying, hey, we've got a new word called taxi and everybody needs, everyone needs it. And, you know, as we all know, this is a, a definite need here. Um, but it's kind of the thing that, you know, people don't really do what they, you know, it's like what they want and what they have to do. Right. So this is a nice add on until you need it. And then when you need it, it's a must. Right. Because you're going, hey, guys, we all have all been in the situations of maybe upset owners or losing owners over this. My, my question is, is how do you take a product that doesn't exist essentially to explaining it and convincing people? Cause you know, look, a lot of people are set in their ways, right? A lot of property management companies, the average property management age is 58 years old. So they're pretty set in their ways. I mean, getting a computer was probably a big deal for them. So now you're kind of going, Hey, now we're going a step further. Right. And they're going, Oh, Todd Breen, he's this guy that, you know, he's in the Philippines and he's got this and he's got that. And he's all over the place. How do you bring that in and bring it across the goal line of, of them mentally 
accepting that hey, this is a product that maybe we maybe we should use it and maybe it, it works. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's pretty simple. You know, Dave was in uh, at a conference uh, not too long ago, and he and he talked with one of our early adopters, and uh, and she said we have been crushing it, bringing in new business ever since we rolled out this. It's our new secret weapon. It's working to help us list new property. And so, you know, we're going out and telling people, hey, you, you know, this is the best thing since sliced bread to change the real estate industry in Australia. And I think before we go much further, you know, listeners need to understand this is three things primarily that get insured. If the tenant stops paying the rent, Surevestor will pick up um, uh, up to 12 weeks in rent. If the uh, tenant needs to be evicted, uh, you can get insurance for up to $7,000 in court costs and legal expense. And there is no deductible on rent, court costs, or eviction legal costs. So it's like no deductible up to all those numbers I just said, which is huge for the average landlord that owns one or two rental properties and an, an unforeseen turnover or disruption in their rent represents a huge disruption to their cash flow. So this is huge, all right? Then the third thing that's insured is if the tenant causes malicious damage to the property, meaning they have the intent to ruin the property, that's covered for up to $50,000. There's some other cool things on there too, but uh, none of this has been available in the United States on a wide scale, affordable, because you know, our average, Dave, what's our average premium that people are spending is 350, 400 bucks a year, right? Yeah, it's a dollar a day. And so, you know, it's affordable and it covers people on this. And so now what, what we're seeing is that when we put this into our marketing pitch at our companies and at our early adopters, a few months later, they're like, wow, we signed up a whole bunch of new properties because people wanted this insurance. And we're also weaving it into our management fee structure, right? So... Uh, we've got the three tiered pricing, good, better, best. Typically the good is the bare bones. We lease the house for you. The better, the middle plan would be, you know, you get most of our services. Best is, you know, concierge, you get all the bells and whistles. We're adding this insurance to the top tier and people are not only signing up to get the insurance, but they're going for our top tier management package to get the insurance and get the concierge service. So at my company, at my management company, we're actually listing more rents, rentals over 2,000 a month than we've ever done in our history since we introduced this. And so, you know, it's, and we're getting our top tier management package sold. So it's been wonderful for our cash flow at my management company. And it's because we've taken something that was success in Australia and rolled it out well here. And so... Yeah. So Steve, Steve, can I just tag on to your question because it's it's really an important one uh, because we do think of all right here's here's something else how am I going to do it what's the benefits in it for me how am I going to how am I going to really promote something it hasn't even been asked for but think about it I mean real estate is probably the most expensive investment that our owners have and they have insurance for it because that's all they know is the insurance for their dwelling to cover things such as fire. Well, how often does that happen? Uh, not very often, but they still have the insurance because what happens if? Now, when you think about an investment property that we're managing, the things that happen to our tenants happen a lot more than say a fire or, or wind or things like that. I mean, we all experience over any period of time, tenants skipping, having to be evicted, even uh, death or murder or suicide or victims of violence. I mean, the, those types of things happen. And when those bad experience happen to our good tenants, what happens to our landlords? I mean, most of those landlords who have a bad experience do one of two things. They either blame us as the property manager and say, well, you guys are the ones who screen the tenants. So, you know, we're blaming you and they make a lot of stress for us and for our staff and they go to somebody else or they say, you know what, this landlord game isn't for me. I'm going to sell. Either way, we're out of business. 
So when you take this asset and we're able to take insurance to protect those things that happen most frequently in an investment property and take that pain and that worry away from our landlord clients, that keeps them with us longer. Another point with this insurance is that it is only available, as I mentioned, to landlords that are professionally managed. So if they, if they leave us as their manager, they don't get the insurance. The insurance is canceled. So it keeps that landlord with us long term. And in Australia, they kept their landlords until they decided to sell. They said yeah, they have this insurance. If they went away or self-managed, they wouldn't get it. And so they stayed with their, their property manager long term. That's a huge benefit for us. And Steve, as you know, I mean, you're the king of BDMs. It is a lot more expensive to bring on a brand new account than it is to retain an account. And so when you can use the insurance to retain your current owners and keep them long term, that's a huge benefit. That's a selling point right there. And it's a value add for your property, man, the property managers. Okay, so let me ask you guys this. So that, that's the product. And, and I think we all agree it's a great product, right? And it's, and it's serving a purpose. I, I guess I'd like to step back a little bit in the, the entrepreneur in all of us in, in the journey that you guys went through. As Alex said, that there was some stumbling blocks, right? It's, it's obviously there, there is a, you know, there's a selling point that you've got to sell this to the client, to the, um, to the property manager who has to sell it to the owner essentially. Right. So you've got to, you need two, it's a two part sale essentially. So let, can we talk a little bit about, I'm just curious as a, as an entrepreneur myself, you know, you guys are bringing something brand new to, to, to market. Right. And, and you're in the, you know, I don't want to say you're on the other side, but you're, you're in the industry now of the add-ons, right. You know, you're selling two property management companies. So as a property management company, I'm going, shit, I got filters, I got, I got, you know, I got melds, I got this, I got, you know, now I got insurance. It's like, it's, it's the add on, right? Do you want, do you want, you know, salt on your fries with gravy? And then, you know, so how, how do you as entrepreneurs overcome that? Cause it, Alex had mentioned that you guys had a bumpy start. Um, like we all do, right? Nobody, you don't start off, you know, hitting, batting a thousand. What, what were those bumps you had and how did you guys overcome them? Cause that, that's what I'm curious to know. Well, um, you know, getting, getting the, um, early adopters, which is what I mentioned about Christina, getting early adopters to actually try, there's always those people that there's the innovator in the, in the adoption curve, the innovator and the early adopter. Then you take the early adopters and create case studies from them. Whenever you're bringing out a new product or service, uh, it's, it's super important to do that. Alex, you went through the same thing when you, launched uh, uh, four and a half, you know, um, people were like, what's content marketing, right? And um, you had to get some success stories. And I think it took you, like I was just at Keith Becker's office, right? And he, and, uh, and Stephanie Gordon visiting with them. And they both said, yeah, it took a, a little while for content marketing to work. And now it's just, it's working great for us, you know? But, you know, it's, it's getting the success stories out there are so important. And that takes patience because uh, uh, when you launch, you're not going to have an overnight success story. And so, you know, we're now seeing a, a, a dramatic uptick in the number of property managers coming into the top of our funnel saying, hey, I'm interested. What do I need to do to adopt? And then handholding is super important. Um, if you don't hold hands with your prospective customers from the point where they say I'm in to the point where they're producing revenue, then you have a laggard sequence and the laggards are the, the devils in the laggards because, uh, you know, typically the number of potential customers in this case, property managers that say I'm in to the numbers that execute, there's a, there, you know, the, that, that goes from top of funnel being wide to middle of funnel being, you know, getting narrow. And so um, the compelling argument is that when somebody is hot to go, you want to get them as far down the field as you can while they're still got some momentum. Because once they actually stall, you're in laggard sequence. And then getting them to move again, there's inertia. So did that answer your question? The biggest challenge... Todd, that we saw with customers, because we, we're all in solution 
solution selling, right? We're selling a solution to other businesses. Um, and, and that presents a challenge, as you mentioned, for, um, from an implementation perspective, because they can be hot and heavy coming from the conference, like, oh, four and a half, we're going to do marketing. And when it comes to doing, you know how many people love doing video? Todd, you, you're a video guy. Like, you know, it, it's, it's the doing part. Yeah, so I, I imagine that's pretty challenging for you guys. Let me, I want to unpack some other things that you, you went through. Um, and I think I want to personally uh, you know, learn from you. You had, you had a partnership initially uh, built up with like four or five individuals. Over time, this partnership sort of changed and morphed into something else. Can you walk us through the formation process and sort of what you started with and when you ended up with? Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, so we actually started uh, back after the um, National NARPM Convention in uh, Atlanta with a, a, a whole group of us. And we were just kind of brainstorming on what we could do for our industry, you know, what other things we could do to help our industry and really focused on how we can help property managers uh, make more money with the current portfolio that they have, not just by bringing on new accounts, which is, is an expensive way to do it. Um, obviously, we all need to do that, but by utilizing you know, fee maximization types of techniques and things to do to help increase uh, all of our profits. And so that's the d direction we started with and ran into antitrust issues along the way with trying to, to do that. Um, we ended up with four of us, four partners, and along the way, we started thinking of our attorney at the time, uh, suggested insurance. And so we got into tenant, <coughs> tenant landlord, <coughs> or ten, I'm sorry, tenant uh, liability insurance. And that was our first product that we started um, along the way and ended up as we were developing that, ran into uh, Terry Shear, as Todd had mentioned earlier, and created this product. Well, our, our one partner decided that he wanted to focus on property management. I mean, th that's, all, all four of us, uh, Todd, myself, and, and Kevin Knight, own property management companies still. And so we're still running property management companies and our other partner decided that uh, that's what he wanted to focus on is that. And so uh, that's how uh, he dropped out of the equation. So um, it was- So, it so was how do you deal with that? Because that changes the equity stake, doesn't it? Like what, what, you don't have to tell us specifically what happened to you but what is the lesson you've learned? G teach us how to deal with a partner fallout. Well, you know, it, it was. It sounds like it was an amicable exit. But yeah. what, like, what, had, what, what did you have to do? So, so you, you you never go into any business partnership without a clear exit strategy. And the, you know, we had a reasonable exit strategy and good cooperation. Uh, the one thing that I've learned is that it can never be clear enough when somebody wants to pull the ripcord. Here's how it happens and it gets executed. Or when somebody fails to meet certain deliverables or measurables, you know, then here's the rip cord or here's the auto adjust. If you set those things up in a, a partnership, you're, 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 I think you've got a better under, or, or chance for a success rate. Did you, Todd, use any person, any specific person, a legal service to help you set up that kind of partnership? Because it sounds it sounds like it could have been a lot worse, right? Um, and th then it, it really was. I mean, a partner exited and that's it, right? All good. The company persevered and continues to, to do so. Um, how did you set that the partnership agreement? Well, yeah, well, I mean, there's shares and uh, shares were returned. And, uh, and we have a, uh, a corporate attorney that's, you know, more or less on retainer that's uh, been there from the start. And we just said, hey, we need to execute the following. And, and away it went. Um, you know, I used to teach a class called Start Your Small Business Now for the Palm Beach County Adult Education. I taught it for several years. And, and it was wonderful to, to do that because I had, you know, again, you get more from teaching than you'll ever get from being a student. I had to really understand uh, what to do there. And, and uh, there's the, t the number one reason a business fails in the first year is, is lack of funding. But the number two or three, I mean, real high is, um, is partnerships 
that were not that are ill-conceived or uh, poorly executed or you know some arguments between partnerships uh, and etc so it's it's an important uh, thing to do if you're not going to be a solopreneur in, in this case we this is way too large a scale of uh, deal for one person to take on uh, so you know it required uh, good partnerships and so you know we're uh, we're doing well in that area because of some of the the, the preconceived ideas we had about a partnership. And Alex, I think that, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just gonna say to Alex, to, to that point, is that, you know, when we're forming a partnership, it wasn't looking at, I mean, we all respected each other, knew each other for a long time, and it was trying to find uh, complementary styles, even though most of us in property manage it, management are uh, A personality styles, but we have different, uh, traits that that and experiences and skills that we can bring to the table and so we're not all uh, say good marketers like marketing isn't isn't my strong point I mean I'm really a, I'm, Todd I'm really, a, I'm a, really well, Todd, I'm Todd is really? I mean no, I'm, no, no. A, I'm a systems you, guy Alex <laughs> you're, pretty excellent. You, you're pretty excellent at it I, I'm sorry to interject go ahead please well thanks but um, I'm a systems uh, guy I, I love the systems I like uh, you know putting things together and, and connecting all the dots um, you know, Todd's the, the marketing guy. I mean, he, he's, he's thinking at the 30,000 foot level all the time, you know? And so it, we have a complementary style when we're putting this together. And so we each can take different parts of it versus competing with each other all the time. So if those listening out there are going to be forming any types of partnerships, I mean, it's, it's important. I mean, we, we like to go into business with people we like, and we all like each other, but we also have, uh, complementary styles and talents that we can bring to the table because as Todd mentioned this is this is a huge endeavor I mean we're trying to bring a product that isn't even known here in, in the biggest market in the world and trying to make it successful and that's a huge feat and there has been a lot of, of things that and it's probably a, a good thing that we didn't have experience in insurance and didn't really know what we were in for because there can be a blessing of not knowing what you don't know because it, <laughs> yeah, because you just go, okay, I'm in. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden you're, you're three and a half years into it and you're just going, holy criminally, this is uh, this is more than I thought it would be. But what, um, three and a half, three and a half years. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. So what, what was it done? Was it two years ago when we sat down at a restaurant and you guys pitched me the idea? Right. Was it two years ago? It was. I had a veal. I remember I had a veal. It was so, like, I don't really remember what I eat. I, that's just zero, like, recollection. I remember Todd had a fish, and I had a veal, and I had a piece of my veal. Like, I actually cut him a little piece of my veal because, you know, he doesn't eat meat a lot, and that was the treat rather than just, like, you know, you ingest all that meat. I get it. Right. But I remember that because it was, it was very profound. Like, I remember your intensity and focus and your excitement about this. I don't remember a lot of meals, guys. <laughs> hey guys, I, I got a, I got a question on the on the partnership thing because th this is something I think that we all you know everyone has had trials and tribulations and, and maybe you know you guys recently living through you know a, a partnership and even a, a little bit of a divesting you know I think it's I, I think it's important for people that are watching this to realize that you need to talk about the divorce like before you even <clears throat> before you even get married like you got to have that conversation of saying guys if we get divorced how does this go? You know, if you have capital invested, how do you get that back? When do you get that back? If, you know, if the, if the business has a cash call, right? I know when we owned, a, when Pete and I owned apartments and, you know, all of a sudden there's a cash call and it's like, Hey, everyone needs to put in $20,000, you know, well, what if you don't have the $20,000? My wife says I can't put any more money into it. What, what do you do with that guy? Does he lose equity in the company? What does he do? So I, I think that, you know, you guys obviously had an amicable split with, with uh, the other person, but, I we, were, we, we were amicable. We could have had a better prenup uh, okay. to put it in marriage terms. We could have had yeah. a better prenup. We did have a prenup, but, you know, prenups, every divorce lawyer will tell you, a prenup, uh, even the best one out there cannot uh, 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 address every potential unforeseen eventuality. And so, um, you know, you, you get a good one. And most importantly, make sure that there is – triggers and actions for the triggers if somebody doesn't want to do what the original idea was and you know 
Um, I've done a lot of psychological uh, um, journey type of stuff where I learn about the psychology of why people do what they do. And uh, um, this is one, you, if you're in business, please remember, expectations are nothing more than premeditated resentments. All right. And so it's important that expectations, huh? That's deep. That is. It's important that expectations get spelled out because then they're not expectations anymore, are they? They're agreements. They're agreements, they're obligations, right? And everybody goes into the relationship just like the marriage saying, they're the best thing in the world. You know, I'm in love, right? And and when they're on their way out of that, um, it, it's the opposite, or it can be the opposite. And so it's typically because communication and and expectation were unmet resentments and uh, or premeditated resentments for unmet met expectations. And I tell you what, man, I try and be as transparent as I can about what I am capable of doing and what I'm not. And uh, we try and just make sure that we keep clear communication and keep the ball moving down the field and, and uh, you know, keep our eye on that end goal, you know. So I, I've got a question for you on that. Sorry, to create Todd. Let, let, um, but I just wanted to sort of put a bow on this one for the audience and myself. Um, take the time to create um, triggers um, in your partnership agreement, as well as the outcomes and what if for those triggers um, early on. And I think it's worth what you're saying, Todd, is it's worth the investment up front to think this through. You can't think of everything, but you can have what you call ripcord clauses in there where you know, the exits are amicable and everybody understands their responsibilities. The responsibility is not being met. It's, it's essentially, you know, a more smooth transition out rather than this fight that ruins the whole thing. Yeah. Do that. Um, okay. So, so Todd, here's my question for you and Dave. Um, look, I, I think I'm a very driven person, right? I mean, I, I don't let moss grow under my feet. Uh, I think you could say, um, you, look, you're, you're a driven guy, right? I mean, look, you, you know, you've got three businesses now. My, my question for both of you guys is what's driving you, right? Is it, is it out of fear or as, is it out of success? Are you driving to something or away from something? And, and is this the last business you guys do? Or is there, is there more in the pipeline? Well, Steve, let me, yeah, yeah, let me start, start with that because, and it's a, it's a great question. And I almost, I look at it as a legacy. Uh, type of type of thing, not of something. Hey, let's go into insurance because we can make a lot of money doing insurance. That was not the driving factor at all, and it it, it never has been. When you look at what this product can do for our industry, uh, it, it's unique. It helps retain owners. It helps to bring on new owners, but just as important, it helps to bring on the self-managed landlords to us. Because again, this product is only available for landlords that are professionally managed. And when you think of our industry and single family, the single family space, the vast majority of those landlords self-manage. And what happened over in Australia is because of this, they ended up bringing on to the professional property managers a huge amount of self-managed landlords to them. And so if we can have that type of impact to bring and improve our industry and, and have that respect and bring that notoriety to our industry and help the single family property managers gain more business through the self-managed landlords because this product is only available for landlords that are professionally managed, that's, that's that 30,000 foot vision that, that we have. And that's why we need really that the help from the industry. I mean, we need the support from everybody behind this because it's, it helps support their own personal businesses and it helps benefit our industry. And so we need everybody behind this to, to make this the success that it can be. I mean, if it's anywhere close to what the success has been and continues to be in Australia, every property manager is going to benefit from it. So, so your, your, your drive is, is legacy of changing the industry. Is, is this the last business? <laughs> well, I, that's hard to answer. Um, 
I, I would say for the, the time being, yes, because we're devoting uh, the, you know, our, our efforts and resources and into this. And as Todd uh, rightfully preaches and teaches, um, you know, we don't build businesses to create jobs for ourselves. We create businesses to provide the lifestyle that we want and, and being able to do the things that we value, which for most of us, you know, we value our health, we value our families, we value, you know, that, types of, that type of time. And we can get that through, through the businesses that we create, not because we, we like to go to work every day, you know. So um, whether I start something else or we start something else, hard, hard to say. But for right now, this is, uh, this is our end game. So let, let's look at this. Let, let's look at this into into a different lens. Um, I want to understand. I mean, I had one business and, and it was growing fast and everything's good and it's going to continue to grow. Um, but I, I couldn't see myself starting another business at the same time. I just couldn't. Now we just implemented EOS and maybe you know, I overcorrected by stepping down completely and sort of going more of a passive role, in fact, a completely passive role to the business, looking for the next thing for myself. You managed to run existing businesses, some of you a couple. Um, walk us through the amount of time Surevestor took, because obviously that was a battle, uh, that was a battle that you fought. Um, and how did you manage your time between your businesses that require some of your oversight, some of your attention. Yes, Todd, you can tell me EOS all day long, but you have 150 people in the Philippines. They're going to, you know, I, you tell me that you have Lucy, you have all these other quality people. You still have to sort of put together a vision, do all the all kinds of things and, and invest all kinds of time into the business. Plus your daughter's running your property management business. I bet she never calls you with questions. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's, that, that, those, those two, how do you manage your time um, with the new venture against your current ventures? So I'm gonna answer that, but I'm also gonna give a nod to Steve's question on my way into that answer. Uh, I'm doing this for the same reasons Dave said, plus cash, right? Um, I wanna change the industry. I wanna make landlords feel like real estate is a, as secure an investment for them and as safe an investment for them as buying mutual funds, stocks, or bonds or any other secure investment because we're securing their cash flow. So like that's that's a game changer, world changer. We'd love to do that in the greatest nation of the world. And re reap the, res you know, uh, uh, Zig Ziglar says, you can have anything you want in this world if you help what? Enough other people get what they want. So, you know, building this to a national scale means I can get whatever I want. So. And I want a lot of those things that Dave mentioned, and I want some things that cash is required for so that I can invite Alex and Steve and Dave to go fishing on a bigger boat in South Florida, right? There's always a bigger boat, buddy. <laughs> always a bigger boat. Yours is, the grilling time is, is an awesome boat, by the way. I, I can't imagine a bigger one, but hey. I can. And so. Uh, <laughs> I can too. <laughs> <laughs> you so, should get it. So, uh, you know, now segueing into what you're saying, Alex, is, is you've, you've asked me this question a lot, like, how do you manage to divide your focus? Um, and, and I went to, I went to a course in the 90s that was life changing for me. And it was one of those little like, you pick up a flyer in the mail, and it says, come to this, like one day event locally for $99. But the top was so fascinating it said how to enjoy your professional life more or something like that and they taught my takeaway from that class was if there's anything you don't like in your professional life then do one of two things make it fun or figure out how to delegate it. and then you're only doing stuff that you like the second thing I've done in my life that's been very significant is, is I've done the Gallup strengths finder test all right and if you do that, you learn out who you are. And I'm an ENTJ on the Myers-Briggs, which is the same thing as Steve Jobs. Don't have any of Steve Jobs' skill sets, unfortunately, or you'd, uh, you know, Todd Green would be as well recognized a name as his. But, um, but it says I have a natural head for business if I remember to consider the feelings of others. So what I've had to do is learn what it means to consider the feelings of others, 
which is hard for entrepreneurs to do. Steve, I see your eyebrow just went up. <laughs> <laughs> what? I have to what? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so part of my effort to, to divide my focus is to understand I'm the visionary and the innovator. That's who I am. It's, it's in my core. So when you ask, is this my last business? Yeah, I don't know. I'm still breathing. So ask me tomorrow. You know, today, this is my primary focus, right? Sure. Um, and, and there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with, 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 you know, riding that skill. I think it's, it's admirable that you do that. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, Pete tells me, you know, when, when I come back from something, you know, he says, man, you, you know, every week you're coming in with 10 ideas. Nine of them suck, but one of them is the moneymaker. Yeah. His job is to figure out which one is the moneymaker. And I'm like, and I'll come back, I'll come back with another 10 next week. Yeah. And he's like, I don't know how you keep thinking that. I'm like, I don't know how you sit there like Dave, you know, I don't know how you sit there and create all these systems and structure and back. I just, it, I, you know, I can't do that. But again, it's so. So how long is your partnership with Pete? How long have you guys been married? We've been married for, uh, let's see. Uh, well, we bought our first apartment complex together in 04, 05. So we've been married going on 15 years. So, so this married. Nothing wrong he, with that. Just saying. So here's the key. All right. When I was teaching, um, start your small business now, do you know what personality style makes the most successful long-term biz small business owner? The methodical. All right. And, you know, where would you be, Steve, without your methodical partner in your business? <laughs> oh, yeah. There, there's, <laughs> I think everyone that knows Pete and I know that I would be off on some tangent on not a bad thing. I'd probably be on some island, you know, selling sand to someone, you know, but yeah, I mean, Pete, Pete keeps me grounded. There's no doubt about it. I mean, there's, we are, we, Pete and I are the true visionary integrator relationship. There you, you know, go. I'll, I'll talk about doing something. I'll be like, Hey, let's do this idea. And he'll say, that's great. How about Q1 of 2020? And I'm like, I already sent the emails out today. Like we're, this is starting now. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is how we, we think so opposite. And well, we'll maybe meet somewhere in the fall, you know? <laughs> And, and virtually incredible, Lucy's and, 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 and my integrator is also Kate, our niece, over in the Philippines. And they both say, you know, Todd, a lot of businesses design a product and then sell it, but you like to sell it and then throw it at us and say, figure it out. And I'm what I do. Oh, yeah, ready, what fire, I do. ready, fire, ready, fire, aim me. is the. Uh... <laughs> they hate me. <laughs> now, okay, so let me, let, me, let me ask you guys this. So let me ask you this. In your guys' relationship, you have, you have a Todd, you have a Dave, and you have a Kevin. Yeah. Right. And how do you guys now there's 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 three involved here. How do you guys integrate each other? You guys know each other, right? Everyone gets along and everything. But how do you guys assimilate on a daily basis? Is it dividing tasks or how do you do this? Dave should answer. Well, well, he's the guy managing me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of like like you and Pete, Steve, and, and it kind of tags on to Alex's uh, previous question is that, you know, how do we end up doing all of this stuff? And it's it's really the concept of the system is the solution. And I really believe that is that when you can systematize things to a point where you have a consistency, which produces consistent results, predictable results. Uh, so you, the expectations of your owners and tenants are met because of the consistency in your systems. It's less stress for your staff. It just makes for a better business. And that's why I focus on on the systems and the processes all the time. And Pete does the same thing. And I got a chance to spend some time down at your office uh, a month ago and go through some things. So it, it's really quite valuable uh, when I can have a, a team that is a great team and set up processes and we are starting to automate most of what we do. So the business can run without me. You know, so I don't have to be you know, spending all this time day in and day out in the business. I've set up a business, uh, I've automated a lot of the processes and now it can work without me wh where my staff can handle things. That's how I am able to, to be able to afford being able to spend time with Servester. And, and so and, when we look at, look okay. at what, what Todd and, Ke and Kevin and I are doing, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, Kevin and I are more on the methodical side of things. I mean, we're, we're the systems guys and so we, we work in that end. Um, Kevin is more focused on the uh, accounting side of, of the business. Uh, I'm more on the 
working on the nuts and bolts and, and the systematizing of things and, and Todd on the, on the marketing big picture uh, type of stuff. And so we have, again, those uh, different talents different. that uh, really we didn't say you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. It just kind of evolved that way. And certainly there's a lot of things within the processes that we joint discuss and, and go, go over. And uh, it really helps us as we, because we respect each other, we can throw out any kind of con concept. We can talk about somebody's idea positively and negatively without you know, hurting each other's feelings. But it, it arrives at a better result, a better answer and so when we're open to that type of discussion, it just helps us make a better, better decisions and better product all the way around. So let me ask you this, and this so I'll, I'll make this my last question and Alex can, can close it all out. Um, I've always learned that the definition of a business is a commercial profitable enterprise that runs without you, right? Which it sounds like that's what you guys have. And it sounds like that's what you're building. Right. And at some point, you guys are going to reach a point in this in this business model that you guys are going to reach a cap of of re reachability right you guys will reach a cap whether it's whether it's mentally physically financially there will be a cap it is is selling this off the table to be able to help more people like if you sold your business and if so do you guys have a sale date in mind of you know it's not to say that you will sell it but when it's running on its own to be able to be sold because now you can go from helping just the people that you know in your influence to maybe like a all state or somebody that underwrites and buys it. What are your guys' well, thoughts? Well, on let, let me just start with kind of a comparison. You own real estate, Steve, uh, for what purpose? To be generating a, a consistent cash flow for you as an investment. If you sold that investment, it's no longer producing for you. All right. Correct. So if you have, have real estate that is being managed by somebody, your, your company's managing it, and now that's performing for you long term, why would you sell it? It's continuing to grow, it's continuing to improve in value, and you're getting a residual benefit from it. It's the same thing with my management company. I mean, I'm building it so it can run without me, but I don't, I'm, may I sell it? I might. But why? It's it's killing it's killing the ca the cow. You know sure. it, that thing's producing for me without me having to spend a lot of time in it. And so right, I'm, to I'm me, that's a perfect sure. investment. Oh, a sure best. Sure. Well, a sure best there would be. You know, we're not even to that point. I mean, certainly when when we get to that point in our mar the market here where we have that penetration. I mean, the world is open. I mean. There's Canada, there's the UK, right. there's Europe. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of different markets that um, we've dreamt about. Yeah, Alex can take, take, help uh, take it to Russia. I mean, the, the world's you, our oyster. Man. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's you know, it's language as well, but yeah, right, we can try. I mean, given how, how you persistent you guys were and wearing this English palace guard uniforms. I mean, come on, guys. dude, you are grown men. Wearing a costume <laughs> and making a fool out of yourself. Alex, among but all your colleagues. Well, memorable. Let me finish. That is, to me, is one of the most, like, that, that's where I gave you all the respect that I had. Like, I, I respected you guys in this venture, but when I saw you looking ridiculous <laughs> because you believe in this so much, right? The, it was a brilliant, by the way, it was a brilliant idea. The Royal Palace but, Guards look ridiculous. I mean, those guys look cool to me. It's, it's a, your opinion. but okay. They look cool. Okay. You wearing that uniform <laughs> is a different game. Okay? And it wasn't even the uniform, right? It was the costume, right? I just, I just want to give it to you guys. This is, like, I, I don't know if I'd be willing to do this. Um, but it certainly worked. It was a brilliant idea. Whoever came up with it um, is, is, is a brilliant strategist. And whoever actually executed it is even more brilliant because you know, you're willing to, like, I see Dave, like, I, I didn't recognize him the first time I saw him. Like, he's wearing this guard uniform. I'm like, who, who the hell is this? And he's all sweaty under the hat. And he's just doing it, man. That's, that, to me, is entrepreneurial spirit. Like, that's the guy, you know, on his third business and still, still hustling. Well, it shows he has a passion for his product. To me, it shows he, they have passion for their product. They believe in what they're doing. That's why I was Sounds curious right. about the, 
about the, you know, if they would sell it to help more people, obviously financially I get, we get all that, but you know, if, if they can get to the masses and going, okay, you know what, we, we, we could probably grow it across the U S but I don't know how we'd grow it in Canada and London, or maybe, maybe they do, you know, into Asia, into Malaysia and all these other, you know, is that, is that, you know, possible? And if it is, you so, know, does that so, help the yeah. industry? Yeah. Well, hang on, hang on. Uh, the truth is we, we have discussed our exit strategy in the past, but we're nowhere near there. Sure. And we also know that we want to help as much of the, um, American market as we can as quickly as we can and we're open to any joint ventures or equity participation that will help us get there faster in a obvious way um, that said uh, we're chugging along doing doing okay right now we're, we're throwing policies and premiums uh, on up on the board and uh, if anybody thinks they can help us do it faster we're all ears so let's let's cool. let's sort of close close this out on on this 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 thing and this this lesson that you're about to deliver for all of us. Um, I know you guys had a big challenge you had to overcome just quite recently, right prior launch, right? You were dressed as a royal palace guard. You drummed up the business. You have a lot of connections. You put your reputations online, guys. People signed up, and there was delays in product delivery. I know you were sweating bullets. I know Kevin was. Kevin and I had a conversation on this. Um, how did you overcome this? This was a challenging time. I remember you guys being rattled on this. What, 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 walk us through it. Well, Dave, do you want to take it? Well, sure. I mean, it, it really, when we, it wasn't just creating the product and the concept of the product, Alex. We had to customize the software. And this is a software that has to do a lot of things. See, it's, my systems guy goes right yeah, into yeah. how the system <laughs> for the yeah, I was just thinking that. Let, let me answer that. this question real quick, because I'm going to answer his actual question, all right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, my dad taught me, when, and Dale Carnegie Training taught me that when you make a mistake, be fast and emphatic and sincere when acknowledging that you made a mistake and seek the... Um, uh, forgiveness, if necessary, uh, but the understanding of the person that uh, you made a mistake with and move on. And so, you know, we had a few people that were detractors that were like, oh, man, that these guys keep talking and they don't deliver. And it's because, yeah, we were starting a brand, brand new system, software, policies, underwriting, claims from scratch on a product that's never been heard of in this country. Now we're, we're past that. And we just said to some of our detractors, hey, we apologize for the delays. We, we're here to help you now today. And those detractors became our advocates. And, uh, you know, so never hide from uh, the people that are giving you a bad review or a complaint. Uh, and run to them and embrace them and say, what can I do to help you? And kill them with kindness and service. And uh, they may or may not be happy, but you've done everything you can. Did, did that answer your question, Alex? I think so. Someone, I want to hear what Dave says. So I think what, oh, sorry, yeah, what Dave, where we're going is, is well, well, there's a lot of challenges with the system and customizing. I understand all that, Dave, but the problem is you promised a, something to clients and you couldn't deliver. This is this is the inflection point where you could you could have uh, um, taken multiple paths, right? And and that's, what, that's not accurate. Yeah, that, yeah that's, we we, ne we never did. Actually, we came out right from the beginning there, Alex and said, this is a soft launch. We're not ready. We, we want to bring this to your attention and, and we'll, we'll get you signed up so you can be the first one to implement this. We never said, hey, we're ready, and then we weren't ready. We never got to, we were never to that point. Well, I, my apology. It was the impression I had, and at least to some extent, what were the detractors? Like, let, let, I don't want to get spend too much time on the negativity, but what were the detractors saying? Like, I don't get it. Then why people are, are, are happy, Todd? Well, they were saying, hey, they, they keep talking about this policy, but uh, when I've asked to use it, uh, you know, they didn't uh, get, get us onboarded. And, you know, at the time we were completely um, creating a systemized onboarding platform that now, like we could throw hundreds of management companies into our onboarding platform and system and the system will take care of it for us and with us. 
And so, you know, we were manually in the soft launch, manually onboarding to learn and refine the steps of the onboarding. And now that person has since onboarded and some of the other people have since onboarded with us and they're in our uh, customer base. So, and Alex, you, know, you know, in a perfect world, you get all this shit figured out before you launch. Uh, but I think I see that. Anyone can, I, I can get it, it Todd. Anyone can do that stuff. <laughs> And we, we also needed to know what the software could do before we could create the processes to, to onboard people. And so that was part of it. I mean, we were waiting for this so we could review the software and see the capabilities before we could set up the process to integrate with the software. And so it just took a lot of time and we didn't have control over it because we weren't the ones uh, creating the software. We were having it created for us. So. Understood. So the visionary goes out and sells the product, right? <laughs> uh, but 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 this is this is kind of what I do because you need to understand the traction and appetite of the market. All that building, all of that stuff, and to me this is so obvious. Like, if I can't sell it, don't freaking build it. Yeah, right? well. But we need to go sell it, and and so this is this is why I'm asking the question. It's a balance. It's a balance, and, and sometimes you have to apologize. Yeah, so, so it was one of these things where you, ha you have your software team saying, hey, this will be ready uh, in, in three weeks, and we're going, yeah, okay. And then yeah. we, we start pre-promoting it with that in mind, and then all of a sudden delay, and then delay. And, uh, you know, so it just, it's unfortunate circumstances, but it happens to us in business. I mean, these are things that you have to be prepared for, and, and you, you just roll with it. I mean, if you're going to get too worked up about it, you know, you, you shouldn't be in business. I mean, this is kind of like the saying when you're going to do a rehab on a property, you know, <laughs> double the cost at 10% and you're about halfway there. Yeah, you know, same and, thing. Do, and double the time that it's going to take you. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, yeah. you know, again, what, what I, you know, I tell people, you know, I remember, you know, when I was doing the, when I was the BDM and I'd be selling stuff and, and uh, Pete was like, what are you saying? And I'm like, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It'll, we'll figure it out. And it was just like, we don't do that. I'm like, we can do it. Don't worry about it. Let's just get, let's just get them on and we'll deal with it. So I, I can, I can, I can relate to overselling because you look, people buy on emotion and they back it up with logic. I mean, that's, that's the reality of selling. So they've got to buy on emotions and then they're going to go back and do their homework. So, you know, if you say, you know, Pete would say like, Oh yeah, we're, we're three years out from doing this. They're going to go, well, that sucks. If I'm going to go, Hey, we'll have this tomorrow. We'll let you know when it's up and running, go ahead and sign here and we'll get this locked up. They're going to go great. And then we'll deal with the, uh, you know, so probably the, 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 the truth is somewhere in between, right? Uh, in my opinion, but yeah, it's not know. in between. It's not in between. Steve. Uh, <laughs> no, the truth is the truth. And, and so <laughs> the solution to, and this is the challenge with, with the visionary versus integrator, but the visionary, I think we all as visionaries here, um, well, except Dave, sorry. Well, what we need to learn, we need to learn to respect the system and the process and EOS gives us this discipline and i think when when you stop being the bdm for your company steve rosenberg that was probably the best day of your company's history actually the more that i've removed myself from the company as as owner and stepping out i can actually give more objectionable it's not me and pete being in a pissing match over sales and operations it's more he and i on the same page as leaders of the company looking at it together so i would agree it's definitely we're we're, we're by me pulling out more and more, I'm actually able to use my strength even better than he and I kind of battling it head to head all the time. So it, the EOS has definitely helped in that without a doubt. Hi, gentlemen. I'm going to go ahead and give it a wrap. This was uh, a, uh, the conversation with four of some of the most successful people in this industry. And I want to, you know, lump myself in this group with a lot of, uh, um, say a lot of respect to to the guests and what all of you were able to accomplish and and will accomplish i mean you know todd is not stopping you know, dave is, is is systemizing he's going you know steve rosenberg who knows what this guy's going to do next that's crazy um and i have my next challenge laid out in front of me as well so gentlemen it was an absolute pleasure i think we gave the audience a lot of takeaways um and uh thank you for your time and until next time be strong do business <laughs>